So I would like to welcome everyone. This is um, the webinar of the Arctic and Genome Phenomenal Analysis Platform. It's, um, it's an introductory webinar to demonstrate the benefits of using the RD Connect Genome Phenom Analysis Platform for rare disease analysis, especially to show the new interface and the features uh, of the analysis model of the GPAP. Uh, I have some housekeeping rules to tell to you. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. And please keep yourself muted during the webinar. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to write it in the chat. We will try to answer it in the meantime, or you can also uh, speak up at the end of the webinar. Mm, we're going to have three speakers today. Uh, first, Sergi Bertran, who's at the head of bioinformatics uh, unit at the SENAG, and he will give uh, a short introduction to the webinar. And then uh, Stephen Laurie is going to speak, uh, who's the lead, who's the lead data analyst in at the SINAG, and he will show us a basic analysis uh, using the RD Connect GPUP. And then Leslie Matalonga uh, will speak, who is a clinic, clinical genomics manager at the SINAG, and she will demonstrate advanced uh, analysis features of the GPUP. So with this, thanks for all, thanks uh, for joining. And I will hand it to, to Sergi. I'm muted. Thanks a lot, Lutz, uh, for uh, getting this starting. Uh, thank you, all of you, for uh, being in the, in the meeting today. Uh, so this webinar uh, is about rare diseases, and more specifically about the RD Connect Genome Femasis platform. I'm, I'm Sergi Beltran, as, as uh, Lutz mentioned. I am uh, leading the bioinformatics unit at the National Center for Genomics Analysis. And this is an institute in Barcelona that, that currently is transitioning to be a, an independent legal entity. Uh, as, as you might know, until now, we were joined with the CRG, with the Center for Genomic Regulation. And actually today and, and tomorrow and yesterday, we are having all the transition to the new networks. And, and hopefully things, uh, we will manage to, 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 to make things work because this is quite a big, um, a big change in IT. And, and uh, hopefully it will not affect the, the, the webinar. Although I know that the Steve and, and Leslie were just having some last minute issues and we're trying to sort this out. Um, I am also uh, co-leading work package 11 in uh, the European Joint Problem of Rare Disease. I'm co-leading this work package together with uh, Anna Rath. And this uh, work package is very much focused on uh, setting up or taking care of the resources that are becoming part of the uh, European Joint Program of Rare Disease Virtual Platform. And, and this system or this virtual platform, what it aims to do is to bring different kinds of data types and resources together from patient registries, biobanks, animal models, cell lines, uh, uh, genomics, metabolomics, you know, uh, not only the, the archiving, but also the analysis, clinical trials, and so on, to cover in a system in which it is easy for the community to, to find out where the resources are that have this kind of data or, or uh, biosamples, but also be able to even make some queries at the, at the data set level to know, okay, so this biobank has so many samples uh, from uh, patients with this disease, or the RD Connect GPAP has so many exomes or so many genomes from uh, patients with this phenotype or that phenotype or with this causative gene and so on and so forth. Okay, so this discovery system uh, is what we are trying to build within the, the EJPRD, but also for some of these resources, or many of them, actually, we have funds to adapt them further to the needs of the rare disease uh, community. One of these resources is the RD Connect uh, Genome Phenomenalysis Platform, which we developed here in Barcelona. It's a, a NERDERC recognized resource. Uh, you can see the addresses here on the at the top left of the screen, and, and Steve and Leslie will run you through this. This is basically a, an online system to facilitate collation, sharing, analysis, interpretation of integrated genome phenome data sets. And the main uh, objective is research on rare disease diagnosis and gene discovery. Okay, so we, what we do a lot in this, or what is really geared towards is to do a lot of data reanalysis and collaborating between different uh, clinicians and clinical researchers to be able to finally solve a case that has a new diagnosis for, for years, and also in some cases discover new genes. So for example, some of the matchmaking activities that we have in the platform and functionalities that we have in the platform that allow you to find 
other patients within the system or in other systems in matchmaker exchange that have a similar set of phenotypes and candidate genes. Uh, currently, the system has over 28,000 genome phenome data sets, uh, contributed by over 100 uh, groups, and has over 600 registered users. If you want to become a user in this system, you need to uh, register into uh, at platform.rdconnect.eu, and uh, your registration will be evaluated. And uh, in principle, if you're a clinical researcher in Europe, approved by uh, our data access committee. And then you will be able to submit and access data into the uh, GPAP. The data into the GPAP is always pseudonymized, but we need to have the link, or you as a submitter need to have the link between the data and the patient from which uh, or from whom it is derived, because one of our goals is that results can be returned to the patients. And uh, this data can be embargoed for up to six months, in which uh, the data submitter can say, look, only me, I want to look at the data. But after that, you know, uh, our uh, uh, main policy or default policy that the data becomes available to the rest of the users, because if you were not able to diagnose that case, hopefully by collaborating with others, then we will be able to move uh, faster in this in this direction. The activity of the users is locked and the security is audited periodically by an external company. What we do in the platform is what you see in the, in the diagram on the left. Basically, we bring the phenotypic data on one end uh, together with the uh, genomic data on the other end together within the system. And uh, all this data is uh, usually captured with uh, uh, community standards such as the human phenotype ontology, the orphan disease ontology, a meme, and in terms of, of files, we use PCFs, BAMs, PASQs, PRAMs, all of which are standards in the, in the community. For uh, archiving raw data, we collaborate with AGA, the European Genome Phenome Archive, and in uh, some projects, we also put all the data there for further reuse uh, by the community. Today, uh, we decided to do a, a, a webinar because we wanted to show the many new functionalities that have been implemented into the system. And among one of those is the new user interface. This was a, a very long awaited development in, uh, in the project because this has enabled us to again, go a few steps beyond what we, were, what we were able to do with the system until, until now. And this has been mainly or, 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 or or, or mostly funded by the European Genome from of Rare Diseases. So I am very happy that we are able to do this today as part of EJPRD because this EJPRD and the users uh, that have uh, been contributed with uh, requests and, and, and have filed bugs have been very, very key into uh, uh, being able to do this at this stage as it is today. So I will not uh, talk more about this because Steve and Leslie We'll go into that. Uh, first, uh, Steve will uh, walk us through a, a very start, very basic uh, lookout on the on the GPAP. and then Leslie will show us briefly some of the advanced features. Uh, many of them, again, have been developed thanks to EJPRD and go towards uh, all these federated discovery of data uh, and and federation of analysis that we have worked so much within EJPRD, but also in collaboration with other projects such as, or initiatives such as GA4GH and Matchmaker Exchange. And then hopefully at the end, we have also a few uh, minutes for questions, uh, but uh, also I will let it to Steve and Leslie uh, uh, decide if they want you to interrupt them while they are talking or, the, or they prefer that you put the questions in the chat and then Lutza manages while we organize them while they are, while they are talking. Okay, so I think that that's it for me. Uh, uh, this is the work of, of many people in the team. Not all of these people are involved with this, uh, uh, certainly, because they are also involved in other projects. But you know, I would like to say to thank the EJPRD partners, the Solberg partners, the members from the European Reference Networks, obviously the Red Disease Patients. We also collaborate uh, a lot with them. And just uh, last week, uh, we had uh, we participated in the, in the Eurodis uh, Winter School and. Um, and uh, a few patient representatives came to the Senac uh, to visit and, and hear what we're doing. But also, and very important, I also would like to, to uh, thank the RD Connect GPAP users and Red Theories uh, here in Spain, which provides us with the Aspera service to be able to collect and manage all these big amounts of data that we are dealing with. So I will leave it here. Um, uh, thanks a lot. And Steve, I think it is up to you now to get the, the thing started. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you, Sergi. See if I can manage to share the screen successfully. Okay, that should be working. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Great. Okay, so thank you all uh, for joining, those of you who managed to connect. I think we're a little bit low on numbers today, but apparently Microsoft is having a, a Teams outage around the world at the moment, so it could be that some people have managed to connect today. So uh, part of the reason we decided, to, uh, what we decided to do today for EJPRD was to, to show you the, the interface that ahead to the GPAP that we launched a couple of months ago. So it's a brand new interface. Uh, in the back end, uh, some of the things are the same, but we also have some new functionalities. Uh, and I'm going to go through how we would analyze uh, a case, a trio, uh, using the GPAP. So as you can see, as Sergi said, we have about 28,000 experiments from about 21,000 uh, families. At the moment, the number is actually slightly higher than this because these aren't right up to date. Most of our data is exomes, but around about 10% is, is genome data. So this is the home page. We log in. And then here you can see that we have a number of different modules. We have the phenotypic data module where we store the phenotypic information. We have metadata about the files that you upload and submit. Genomic analysis, which is what I'm going to be showing today, uh, the cohort analysis module that Leslie may touch upon, uh, and other modules that allow you to, to manage your data. So I'm going into the genomic analysis model, module, and at the moment we're still uh, supporting the previous version and the new version, but today, of course, we're using the new version. And when you first load the new version, uh, this is what you get. You get a list of, of, of previous uh, studies that you have saved or undertaken or studies that have been shared with you. And today, because we're going to do a, a straightforward analysis, I'm going to select case analysis. We give our analysis a name so that we can save it later and re-identify it if we want to. I'm going to call it EGPRD Workshop. Continue. And then we have a number of different types of IDs by which you can uh, identify your, your case or your experiment. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use the Phenostore ID of a a real case. So this is a real case within the platform. And then we have to select it. And you'll see when we select it, it automatically offers us all other members of the same family. So you can see this is a trio, the index case that I've loaded, and the mother and the father. And if we didn't want to analyze them, we could remove, I mean, if we didn't want to include the parents in the analysis and just look at the individual, uh, we could remove them, but we'll uh, use the trio. We go to next. And here it's loading the phenotypic information uh, of the of the case and the parents. And also you can see the, the pedigree tree here. So you can see who's who. And now we can decide upon the, the mode of inheritance. So as you can see in this case, the, the parents are unaffected and the, the child is affected. So our first suspicion uh, would probably be that it's an autosomal recessive disease and that the parents are, are likely to be carriers. And when we select autosomal recessive now, we get both the simple homozygous autosomal recessive, but we also get the, the compound heterozygous filters. Here you can see the simple homozygous, we'll assume it's uh, that the parents, automatically we assume the parents are carriers, they have one reference allele, one alternative allele, and that the, the child, the affected child is homozygous for the alternative allele. There's some quality settings that can be adjusted here, but I'm not going to go into them much today, but essentially we're asking for a depth of at least 10 reads covering any position uh, that we're investigating and a genotype quality of 30. And then for the competitors, I guess, we, we show it like this, but uh, I'm sure you understand the point of the competitors, I is that the, the 
affected individual will have uh, two heterozygous alleles and the parents will have one heterozygous allele and one reference allele uh, and they will be different for the two parents so this is all set automatically so you don't need to worry about this so then we hit next and then here we have the list of filters uh, sorry yes the list of filters that we apply for the analysis we want to undertake so i'll go through these a little bit in detail so the first thing is the type of variant so for example you can look for variants that are in climbar as pathogenic or likely pathogenic you can look for a variant you can look for variants based upon their effect on the protein so in this case we usually select high impact variants or moderate impact variants high impact variants are those that, that destroy protein function in principle like nonsense variants uh, and truncated variants and moderate are those that change the sequence of the protein of course either of these can be severe or, or not very severe but these are the ones we're usually most interested in. We also have, uh, you can select for SMVs or indels, but if we don't select anything, we'll get both SMVs and indels. We can, we have tag variants, which Leslie might talk about, and you can select by a transcript biotype as well. So these are the variant types. In the population, you can filter by the nomad allele frequency and the internal allele frequency. And we'll be using those later. We have the machine learning tools that are popular, Mutation Taster, SIFT, Polyfen, and CAD. Uh, although we in-house don't generally use them for filtering, but you can select, for example, only disease-causing or polymorphisms from Mutation Taster or damaging, uh, variants predicted to be damaging by SIFT. And also, you can select a particular chromosome and a start and end position if you just want to see all the variants in this particular region. Uh, and also we calculate for all uh, experiments that are uploaded we calculate runs of homozygosity over a, over a length of 0 0.5 megabases and if you want you can specify that you only want to see variants of a certain type within a run of a certain length we also have uh, filters by genes you can apply so you can check you can select a gene list from a number of predefined lists for example Muscle gene table has a, is a list of uh, 611 neuromuscular genes that's curated manually each year. Uh, you can take almond autosomal dominant genes. Uh, you can uh, look at the uh, autosub spectrum disorders from Safari. So you can use these uh, to select only genes that are on these lists that may be of interest. You can uh, type in a gene name, for example, if you're interested in titan, you could select titan. And you would only get variants in titan you can do a list of genes as well you can also uh, use uh, panel apps from genomics england so brain channel off face etc they're all here to select and you can also these are the actual HPOs that are associated with this individual, which I'll show you again in the Phenostore record in a minute. But the, the individual we're looking at has uh, shows intellectual disability, has seizures, has EEG abnormality, and has delayed gross motor development and language impairment. So you can actually get genes that have been associated to these HPO terms and then filter only to these genes. And also you can look for certain pathways. Let's see if there's anything cardiovascular. So here we have cardiogenesis, so we could get genes that are involved in cardiogenesis pathways or cardiac conduction, etc. Okay, so that's all the filters that are available. Now I'm going to go ahead with my analysis. So here uh, we've selected autosomal recessive, and we're going to look at high and moderate first. So we're getting variants that are affecting uh, the protein coding sequence. So we start the analysis. And you'll see we have one set of results for autosomal recessive, the simple, and you can see it gives us a number. We have 540 SMVs and indels that are uh, at least of moderate impact, as shown here, moderate or high, and are segregating in an autosomal recessive manner in this pedigree. And you can see that you have a, a large degree of information here. You have the gene that's affected, you have the nucleotide and the, and the P dot, 
a summary, you have the consequence. Let me just scroll down. And you can see the 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 uh, if if a certain gene is in OMIM, it will be listed here. You can see they automatically calculate the evidence from the ACMG, and you can see the ACMG classification here. The American College of Medical Genetics is actually benign for these first ten variants. You can see the population frequencies, the CAD score here, and the Revel SIF polyphenol uh, mutation taster values. This is just showing ten variants because you can see we have. 540, so we can select 100 instead, and then you can see all 100 are shown here. If we click on the compound heterozygote, it will run the compound heterozygote query. Again, looking for high and moderate. Of course, being a C het, we will get two hits. So every variant, uh, there will be a pair of variants always reported for each gene. There will be at least two variants, two or more. As you can see for the first one, this is position uh, 1069970, and then the next one is position 107142641. They're both affecting CAS Z1, so this would be a potential pair of homozygotes. You can see one has no classification, but in Klimbar it's a VOS, and the other one is a VOS as well. And you'll see that there's lots of pairs here, so there's lots of possibilities here. Of course, as we're concentrating on rare diseases here, you'll see some of these variants are very high frequency. So this one is at 74%. In Nomad, this one is at 33%. This one's at 3%. So none of these could actually explain a rare disease. So we want to adjust our, our uh, filters. And we could have done this from step one, but I'm doing it in two steps to, uh, for, for educational purposes. Uh, so if we go to population, for a rare disease, which is something that affects one in 2,000 people or less in Europe. I'm right, just having some trouble with my number keys here, 0 0.02. Low, but get there eventually. Okay, 0 0.02. So I'm, ex I'm, I'm asking for a frequency, an alternative allele frequency of 1 in 50. So 1 in 50 squared is 1 in 2,500. So this is a, a reasonable frequency for most rare diseases. Well, nearly all rare diseases will be less than 1 in 2,500. We rerun the query. And you'll see now we only have 40 compound hit variants. So we have 20 pairs, most likely. So two CSZ1 still passed, two COBOL, two DNA H7, well, three DNA H7, you can see. So there's uh, two pairs here at least, possibly three pairs. So these would all be uh, candidates that might be rare enough and might be uh, involved in, in disease. Uh, and we could do the same for the simple compound heads. Uh, sorry, the, the simple autosomal recessive. Again, we go to new query, go to bivariance. Not sure why the connection is quite so slow here. And again, we run the query. So now we're looking for rare autosomal, simple autosomal recessive, and there's only two candidates here. You can see these are benign and lightly benign here. And if we go back to the compound heads, we have, oh, sorry, I've gone too fast for the system. Give me a second. So if we reload the 40, you'll see there's a lot of VOS, there's some likely benign, but there's nothing that really jumps out at us. Remember, most variants will be VOS in the end, right? Ideally, we would like to have something that was likely pathogenic or pathogenic, and we don't have anything obvious there. So if we go back, we can do 
Ah, yeah, I forgot I wanted to show you this. Right, so just quickly. We can click on the participants again. And when we open the participant window, we can go straight to the phenostore record. So this is just to show you what the phenostore record looks like. So this is where we keep the phenotypic information. You can see it has what we had before. We have the trio, we have the case, and we have uh, the signs and symptoms, which we're looking at the HPO terms here. Okay. So given that we haven't seen anything uh, using the autosomal recessive, another possibility is uh, let's do a new analysis applied to the current sample. So we're working with the same trio, but let's see if we find anything in the de novo. So in a de novo, we would expect the parents to be uh, homozygous for the reference allele. And because the individual has a, a new mutation, a de novo mutation, we'd expect them to be heterozygous. So we apply these settings. We run the query. And you can see here the novel, we have nine results. So we have nine variants here that are apparent that are apparently the novel. Uh, and you can see that there's a couple of high impact variants here, which might be more interesting than others. Uh, but there's still a few votes here, but you can see here one variant is actually pathogenic in Klimva. If we look at the allele frequency, you can see that even though some of these are the novel, some of them are fairly common, right? So this one's a this one, this variant is actually seen 25% of the time in the freak, in the population. So this one's unlikely to be a real de novo. And this one is seen at 1.6%, and this one is seen at 1.1%. Of course, if it's a de novo and it's causing disease, we need to uh, reduce our allele frequency uh, substantially. So we would filter by, instead of 0 0.02, we would be able to filter by 0 0.0004, which is 1 in 2,500. And if we run that query, you see we now get reduced to four variants, and fortunately we keep the one that's pathogenic in Klimpa. So if this was a brand new analysis, we would be very interested in seeing what this was. This is a pathogenic variant, uh, apparently in Grin 1. So we have a whole set of links here, different types, pharmacogenetics, or data discovery, the beacon, pubcase finder, gene information, all these databases. But we also have the frequent links. And the most useful ones in general are we like to go to Klimba, obviously in this case, because it's in Klimba. We'd also like to go to OMIM to find out a bit more about the gene. Uh, and if we go to Klimba, we can see that this one is pathogenic. It's been reported twice as pathogenic by different entities, uh, Fondacion Telethon and the University de Lille. And also for both, for well, one for intellectual disability, autosomal dominant, and one for developmental and, uh, and epileptic, epileptic encephalopathy. And if we look at GRIN1 in OMIM, and the autosomal dominant form. Uh, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder with or without hyperconnectic movements and seizures, autosomal dominant. So if you remember this individual, actually, uh, if we have a look again here, unfortunately, I closed the I closed the phenostore window. Uh, but you can see that this individual had an intellectual disability, they had seizures, delayed motor development, EAG abnormality. So these uh, phenotypes all match very well with this uh, GRIN1 gene and with a autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. So this would be a, a very good candidate for follow-up and specifically since it's already been recorded by other groups as being pathogenic in Klimba, this would be a, a good example of a likely uh, a variant that's likely to explain the phenotype of this individual, and indeed in this case it was, and this is why this uh, this uh, variant has been tagged here uh, as pathogenic, and this case was resolved uh, based upon the presence of this variant. So that was my quick run through. I had 
to see if I can work out how to stop sharing. And I hope that was clear to you. And uh, as we said at the start, we can take some questions at the end, I, th I think, once Leslie's done her bit too. Uh, so you can put your questions in the in the chat and we'll address them at the end of the talk. And now I'll hand over to Leslie, who will tell you about the more uh, some more advanced features of the platform. Thanks, Steve. So I'm going to share my screen too. So um, Steve has shown you how to do a, a case analysis and a single tone or family analysis is possible this way. And now what I'm going to show you is um, are other functionalities that the platform offers that go uh, beyond, beyond this uh, family um, based analysis. The first one will be the cohort analysis. So once you have um, uh, access to the patient in the system or your own patient, how you can use all uh, the, the phenotypic data and the, the genomic metadata to create cohorts and then real, um, perform an analysis uh, on those. We will also uh, go into patient matchmaking, meaning how you could identify similar patients to yours in the database, but also uh, using uh, matchmaker exchange and reaching other international ready patient databases. And uh, finally, uh, I will show you how from the information you have entered in the system and once you have done your analysis, uh, you can create uh, a, a clinical report uh, with the information that we have in the system that you will see that you will be able to edit and this uh, is aims to facilitate you um, this final part before reporting. So I will start with the cohort analysis. So uh, once we are here in, in the in the main page main page of the genomic analysis, you click here in cohort analysis, and uh, what you will have first is uh, a list of the different cohorts you might have uh, created within the platform. So I will start with an existing cohort, and um, after I will show you how you would uh, create those. Uh, so here I have a, a list of um, different cohorts. Uh, I will pick the last one, which are uh, 719 patients uh, that are from ear and epicare and present with uh, scissors. Then I select this cohort and I can create my study. And the next step would be um, to identify for the different um, patients the variants I want to retrieve if uh, I want only heterozygous variants or also uh, homozygous variants. So I can select in this case uh, for the purpose of, of the workshop, can, we can uh, select both. So I will retrieve any patient with a, with a variant. Uh, then here, and this is the the, uh, the most interesting part where, where you can really uh, play with if you have, for example, specific genes of interest or you, you have identified a possible new disease causing gene, then you can uh, go through the different uh, filters that uh, Steve uh, have uh, shown you and, for example, uh, add your gene of interest and, and then run the query. I will show you uh, now how to, to do this, but also with a, a predefined gene list just um, for the purpose of today. I could select, for example, uh, the ACMG um, secondary finding uh, list so that we have a, a set of, of genes to look at. And then um, similarly at uh, what uh, Steve just showed you, uh, you can uh, decide which filters to apply or um, you can also use predefined filters because um, once you, you have preset a set of your filters of interest, you can save this in the system so you don't have to each time uh, re-enter this information. For example, uh, here if I select the, uh, the first predefined filter and I apply it, you will see that automatically uh, all the filters have been pre-filled. So here we will be looking for variants that have a high, moderate or low impact at the uh, protein level and that are um, rare uh, based on information on population frequency. So now uh, I can run the query here. You have to take into account that um, uh, the more number of patients you have included on your core or the more uh, number of genes that you want to look at, it might take uh, more or, or less time. And here is the, the view for your uh, results. 
So on the left panel, uh, you can see all the genes that were uh, included in the gen list uh, I selected. Um, and then here on the right and on the results part like in the center, uh, first you have information on all the participants that might have a variant in any of those genes. But then uh, if you want to go into more details in your gene of interest, for example, here I can select the back uh, three gene. If I, I click on it, I can see then only uh, the participants that have uh, variants in these genes. And uh, here I get the, the number of variants associated. So I have 19 different uh, variants in uh, 23 participants. And the same here, if I open the participant view, I can see uh, the list of, uh, of the patients and also information on uh, the HPOs entering the system and the diagnosis to see if they, they are, for example, similar to, uh, to my patient or make sense with my genes of interest. Moreover, um, if you look into the variant and you are interested in a specific uh, variant, you can also uh, select that variant and then it will automatically update and you will get uh, the participant uh, the information on the participant that has this uh, specific variant. And you can play with this really to identify uh, other cases uh, in the system. And um, I can scroll, if I go back to, to the whole participant. If you select uh, the table, I don't know why I cannot scroll now to the right, but uh, on the right of the table, you will have a, a contact button. I oh, know it's different now, sorry, they changed it. Uh, so if I have a, a, a patient of interest where um, that I think uh, I would like to reach um, the submitter of that case to maybe start a collaboration, you can then click here on the contact button and then an email will be sent uh, directly um, to you and the submitter of that case to start a collaboration uh, and then um, maybe you can discuss in more details the, the clinical information uh, of this patient and see if it really makes sense for, for your uh, re research or, or diagnosis. So this will be how you analyze um, uh, a cohort and uh, now I will show you how you create these cohorts uh, very briefly. So you can uh, have access from the, the main page to the, to the cohort uh, application. And uh, here is the, the dashboard that you will get. So uh, if you want to create a new cohort, we will go uh, here. And then now you will have an overview of all the information you have access to uh, in the system, your samples, but also uh, the samples that can be uh, shared within uh, the RDConnect platform. Uh, from here, uh, you have different types of data you can uh, filter by. For example, if you are a part of an ERN or um, in this case, not before we selected ERN Epic Care, you can uh, go for uh, patients and, and relatives submitted uh, to this specific group. Um, then you can, uh, for example, filter by samples or patients that only have uh, genomic data in the system, not only the phenotypic information, and uh, so on and so forth. You could uh, filter also by index cases so that if you don't want to get uh, relatives in your in your court or ensure that uh, you are filtering by uh, individuals that are affected by our disorder. So you can pre-select uh, based on those, this clinical and, and, and metadata information and then apply these filters to create the first part of, of your cohort. Uh, again, as, um, as you have access to, to many samples, this might take uh, several seconds uh, because um, it has to go through all the, the metadata of the, the experiment. So now I have uh, created my, my cohort. I can see uh, information on the filters I have applied here. So we selected here in Epicare, uh, index cases that um, and also are uh, affected. So um, I can 
stop here and then uh, save my cohort, but I can go further and maybe I'm interested in a specific symptom. So when you click into the clinical exploration, what the system does is to aggregate all the data uh, from this specific cohort so that you can see um, the symptoms that are associated to the patient with the number of participants that have one or another. And then from here, you can also select uh, the, the, the symptoms you are interested in um, for your analysis. And uh, in the third uh, tab, the data table, you can have an overview of all your patients and uh, download this information, the patients that are in, in your specific cohort. Uh, once you have done uh, your filtering, you can then save the cohort. I can save it with the um, workshop EGPRD. And uh, then uh, the cohort gets saved in the system and uh, automatically you will have the information available for further analysis. And if you go back to your uh, dashboard, you will see at the bottom that here you have all the cohorts that have been created. And by clicking here in Analyze, you, can, uh, you will be uh, redirected directly uh, to the platform for performing the analysis we uh, just did uh, before. So this is um, part of the cohort application. Uh, the next one we wanted to uh, briefly show you is the patient matchmaking. And this is mainly, as I mentioned before, to identify a similar patient based on the clinical information and the uh, genomic information in the system within uh, RB Connect, but also reaching other database through uh, matchmaker exchange. So uh, here you will have the list of uh, the patients you have submitted and uh, for whom you have uh, given access uh, for this type of uh, discoverability. So, for example, if I select uh, the, the first patient I have, uh, first you will have uh, to select the target endpoint so to in which database you want to try to identify similar patients. So, uh, here I can select RD Connect, which would be um, the data that is in the system, but you can also reach uh, Phenome Central, Decipher, Magin2, or uh, the Broad Institute. And um, then automatically we pull the information that you have entered in the system. Um, basically, we use uh, the gene where you have identified a variant of interest and also all the HPO uh, from the patient uh, that you enter in the system. And when you submit uh, this query, uh, now what the um, algorithm does is to, um, based on the HPOs and uh, variant identified in, in genes of interest of the other patient in the system, it gives a score from 0 to 1 um, th that would um, illustrate the similarity between patients. Um, there is 0 0.5 points that go into the phenotypic similarity and 0, 0.5 that go in, into the uh, gene uh, match. So, for example, here the system uh, tells us that there are uh, three uh, patients identified uh, that might have some similarity with ours. Uh, here you have the score, and uh, on the right you have information on the phenotype. So you can quickly see if uh, one of these patients is uh, really similar to you or at least of, of interest. And if so, uh, again, similarly at what you had for the um, cohort, uh, you can con click on the contact button and then an email uh, will be sent uh, to you and the submitter of that case so that you can start a collaboration. And then uh, if you go back to your to the, the main, main, main page of the analysis, uh, the last uh, functionality we wanted to, uh, to show you is the clinical report. So once you have done uh, the type of analysis that Steve uh, was showing to you and you have identified a possible causative variants, and you want to uh, uh, report them, uh, you can go to this uh, uh, module. And if I select, um, for example, the patient we were looking into, into uh, matchmaker exchange, I have two uh, pathogenic uh, variants that I have identified in the system in the Myo9A gene, and I can select if I want uh, one or both to be included in my uh, uh, report. And here I can click on download clinical report draft or a download variant, which uh, in this case will give us uh, a table with the information entering the system for 
those specific variants. If I open uh, the report, what I will get here is uh, a template with the uh, information that you enter in the system prefill so that uh, you would uh, basically need to include the interpretation uh, of the variant and the final conclusion, but that the system has already prefilled most of the information regarding, for example, uh, the clinical data and the methodology used uh, in for the analysis that was already in our uh, system. And uh, I think I will uh, leave it here. It's quite a lot of information, but I think we tried to give you an overview of all the different approaches and functionalities that uh, uh, the system has 